um, uh, all the um, uh, other things related to microbiology uh, that you would need to know. Uh, first of all, actually, uh, this um, uh, uh, the mm, uh, the lecture series has been organized by the Ministry of Health uh, in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists. And um, uh, what I want you to kind of uh, do is uh, you need to listen carefully because we also have uh, where there are six of uh, us uh, doing the lecture series and. Uh, I hope you would be um, uh, attentive to these uh, things because uh, most of the time I know uh, you are logging in uh, from uh, various places and you might be busy all day, but uh, take a time to kind of... Uh, uh, listen to these uh, lecture series because it is uh, it has been organized for you all because we uh, time to time in day to day life uh, practically we face a lot of uh, problems uh, in managing infections because uh, basically the intern uh, officers do not actually know these things uh, so this is very important even though bacteria are very small microbiology is really vast so uh, you need to uh, uh, attentively uh, listen to these lectures because we are trying to cover most of the uh, microbiology related things um, uh, especially uh, collecting and transporting of specimens how would you kind of approach um, uh, various specimens and um, uh, there would be a lecture on sepsis, there would be a lecture on rational use of antibiotics and the uh, uh, things related to uh, microbiology which you need to know. So uh, uh, the resource person for the workshop today would be uh, myself, Dr. Vasana Kudagamana, Dr. Vaidehi Francis, uh, Dr. Geetika Patabendige, Dr. Madhumani Abhivadana, and Dr. Nadesha Badana Singha. And all of them would be uh, talking to you regarding sepsis, antibiotics, uh, allergies, uh, which is a very hot topic these days uh, regarding usage of antibiotics and collection and transport of specimens. Uh, the list goes on. So, um, uh, so uh, the the overview. Sorry, the overview that I have uh, uh, initially uh, showed to you was the uh, overview of uh, our uh, workshop today, and this is my lecture overview. I will give a brief introduction, and uh, I would talk. Uh, regarding uh, services related to microbiology and the diagnostic services and the referrals and the antibiotic recommendations I would briefly touch on and the uh, infection control, the overall um, uh, the uh, setup in the hospital. So when you go to a hospital, probably the interns are based, uh, re, um, the, the intern officers would be uh, currently based uh, from uh, base hospitals above. So there would be teaching hospitals, base hospitals, as well as provincial general hospitals and national hospitals. So depending on what the hospital that you would be working on, the services related to microbiology would be slightly deeper, but uh, these are the things that they do uh, as a overall. So basically, as you all know, we do cultures that is like uh, diagnostic services, especially uh, related to um, infectious diseases. And we also give antibiotic recommendations. That is why we do uh, ward rounds, especially in ICUs as well as uh, in wards. So most of the time, apart from your consultants, I would be meeting you all or the microbiology would be meeting you all regarding antibiotic recommendations. And we are uh, uh, giving our services uh, regarding infection prevention and control. So there would be a separate uh, activities related to infection pre prevention and control in the hospital and you would be very much actively involved in these things also. So uh, under the consultant microbiologist, there would be uh, two teams actually. Uh, I'm uh, 
introducing you to these uh, two uh, teams because time to time uh, you would be talking to them you would be interacting with them and you would be seeking advices and seeking help from them so the the one uh, part of the uh, team would be uh, the microbiology related team that is um, uh, under the consultant microbiologist there would be a medical officer in microbiology and she is or he would be the one who with, would clinically liaise with the ward staff including you all uh, apart from the consultant microbiologist and there would be uh, MLTs uh, who would be performing the uh, microbiology diagnostic services and there would be a separate microbiology laboratory in most of the hospitals and under uh, the, the bottom part would be the minor staff or uh, there would be lab board early or lab assistants. So all of them time to time you would be talking to them and you would be uh, asking about the cultures and you would be trying to trace the cultures the first thing you need to know is they are very friendly most of the um, uh, people in microbiology we are lucky to say that uh, most of them are very friendly and very helpful so you need to build up a very good rapport and need to be very very polite for them to them because uh, uh, what i believe is um, being polite to others would uh, reciprocate the politeness and the respect uh, towards you as well so uh, because uh, even though you are busy you need to realize that they are also busy so they are even though you don't see much of the the activities that they are doing uh, they do a lot of huge work uh, behind a report that you would be getting so they are also uh, very busy uh, so be mindful when you are talking to them uh, try to always approach the uh, uh, laboratory through a medical officer so because most of the time they are be a medical officer uh, in microbiology uh, so uh, it would be better for you to kind of uh, approach through them so that is the hierarchy that we are supposed to kind of maintain and need to uh, try to kind of remember that uh, you can have their numbers uh, you can even uh, most of the microbiologists uh, would uh, be answering the uh, intern officers uh, calls also uh, because uh, when there is a need if you can want to uh, contact we are always contactable and um, regarding the infection prevention part because uh, most of the time that th those are the two main roles that uh, the consultant microbiology would be playing in the uh, hospital one is uh, diagnostic services and the other one is infection control infection control also uh, some of the uh, hospitals like teaching hospitals maybe the uh, the hospitals above uh, those national hospitals maybe provincial general hospitals might have a medical officer in infection control but most of the team uh, the hospitals do not have a MO in infection control uh, so the you would be directly um, like um, uh, uh, liaising with infection control nurses and the infection control team so there is a separate infection control unit in the hospital and uh, depending on the um, the size of the hospital the number would differ again uh, most have two or maybe more uh, and under them there is a liaison nurse who is a nurse working in a particular ward or unit and then uh, this nurse has been trained or maybe like uh, has been practiced regarding the infection control things so they they are called uh, liaison nurses in infection control they are uh, a, a, a member of the uh, ward actually uh, so if you have an infection control problem you need to uh, know who your uh, license nurse would be in the ward and you need to approach them especially regarding infection control practices and sometimes during the occupation exposures you need to uh, work with them very closely so uh, I would be talking about a 
uh, would be talking about uh, the role of microbiology lab. So the main, uh, there are two main roles of microbiology lab. One is clinical and the other one is uh, epidemiological. So clinical, you can understand uh, what they would be doing. They would be performing uh, various tests in the help of diagnosis of infections uh, and uh, in order to help in management of the infection. So uh, there would be various uh, uh, specimens that you would be, we would be processing in the lab. Uh, it all in aid to kind of uh, help in diagnosis. So the epidemiological role is mainly in supporting infection prevention and control. Uh, mm -hmm. In uh, This would help us in searching for the source and the route of transmission of the hospital acquired infection. So especially during the outbreaks, uh, we would be performing several cultures and performing several investigations uh, to help us in identifying the source and the route of the transmission so that we can get hold of the outbreak uh, under control. So when we talk about the diagnostic method of infection, the most classical uh, uh, diagnostic methods would be direct smears or microscopy, uh, cultures, antigen detection, and serology testing. So when we talk about the direct smears, uh, those are mainly we would be doing gram stainings of uh, several specimens, uh, especially um, uh, in uh, blood cultures and uh, even in pus uh, that we would be receiving, uh, we would be doing gram staining whenever uh, the consultant or the clinical team uh, would need a direct smear and a very quick uh, identification of the organism, we would perform the uh, gram staining. That is the most common direct smear that we would be do, doing. And there would be other things depending on the availability and the facilities uh, like uh, uh, KOH smears and uh, there are various other uh, uh, grams, uh, the, the staining methods that we are using at the moment and I'm not going to go into details because it is not really relevant to you all. Uh, the cultures, of course, we are mostly doing the bacterial cultures and together with the cultures, we are performing the uh, antibiotic sensitivity testing and um, uh, antigen detection time to time we are doing especially in our hospital we would be doing uh, uh, rapid testing for antigen uh, in dengue and uh, hepatitis um, and uh, serology testing or depending on the availability we would be performing uh, that depends on the uh, microbiology laboratory that you would be having and the facilities that they would be having. Uh, apart from these classical methods there would be molecular methods again depending on uh, where you are practicing uh, because uh, molecular methods uh, at the moment are confined to kind of uh, larger hospitals. But um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were equipped with uh, PCR machines. So uh, depending on uh, what you have in the hospital, you would be um, uh, using these molecular methods to identify infections also. Uh, one thing is uh, classical methods take a longer time whereas molecular methods take uh, lesser time uh, so uh, you would be lucky if you have molecular methods in your hospitals and even in the classical uh, pathway we always try to kind of get into uh, give you a good uh, quality report uh, as uh, from the most um, uh, uh, lesser time, I would say. Uh, so uh, for that, uh, we need your support also. Uh, I think uh, when um, the uh, collection and transport of specimen is done, uh, you would be uh, given some tips to kind of uh, reduce these um, uh, the lag time of uh, getting a, a culture report. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details. 
So uh, the samples usually, again, as I said, uh, depending on your uh, uh, microbiology laboratory and the services, uh, the sample that we, uh, would be accepted to the lab would differ. But these are the samples usually uh, taken into, even in a base hospital, these samples would be uh, processed. Uh, uh, blood cultures, uh, blood cultures, there are two types actually, uh, automated cultures, that is uh, using automated machine that we are performing blood cultures. So you have a separate uh, uh, specimen collection bottle for that. And there are manual cultures also. Uh, urine, uh, in, even in uh, base, uh, lesser hospitals than base hospitals would be performing, that is the most uh, simplest form of culture, I would say. Uh, Pus tissue uh, would be taken into cultures, various sobs like ears, sob, wound sobs, and throat sobs, respiratory secretions such as sputum, uh, tracheal secretions, and uh, ETT secretions would be uh, taken into uh, cultures. Stool, uh, depending on uh, whether you your lab would be performing or not, uh, that will be accepted. Uh, CSF sterile fluid, aspirations, and samples re related to infection outbreaks, as I said earlier in the uh, lecture. So these are the ones that we commonly perform. Uh, at the moment, in teaching a hospital coliopatia, we would be performing all. When there is a sample that we are not performing, uh, that is also, uh, we have given uh, some instructions and uh, there are guidelines to send these samples into uh, uh, the um, reference lab or maybe uh, to a place where the uh, things are getting done. So uh, depending on the availability, those will be uh, introduce you to uh, introduce you into uh, those things would be uh, in the uh, I think uh, there would be another introductory uh, lecture uh, in the hospital that you would be going and uh, the things that is to be done in the hospital and the things that you are supposed to send to a reference lab would be uh, uh, introduce you uh, to um, during that lecture. So, as I said, uh, the microbiologists would be uh, performing a huge role in the management of uh, infection. Uh, infection infective patients and uh, this diagram actually shows you how it would be like uh, done in the uh, hospital because it is there is no kind of uh, uh, hard and fast rules there but um, most of the things will be like uh, this is multidisciplinary we can't really do a, a service without you all and you uh, we need to there is always collaboration between the clinical team and the uh, microbiology team. So uh, taking specimen, it is very important um, uh, that uh, you need to take a proper specimen and to take a proper specimen and to collect it and transport it, store it, uh, would directly have an impact on the proper quality uh, culture reports. So we would be talking about it later in the workshop and we need to uh, transport this specimen into um, uh, the uh, microbiology laboratory where we would be uh, doing processing the culture, identify and we do the sensitivity and we uh, issue a written report. Mind you that um, the, the always the uh, identification might not be the pathogen. Uh, that is why we always need to have a good collaboration with the clinician and the microbiologist. So uh, the request form is really important and there is a constant there should be a constant information flow between the clinician and the microbiology and the laboratory. Uh, in order to have a good uh, written report uh, of the culture or maybe the uh, microbiology investigation that you would be doing. So 
that is for the diagnosis uh, of uh, an infection and uh, we also uh, play a huge role in prescribing also uh, so as i said earlier also we are doing a daily icu round and uh, we would be giving and we are offering our antibiotic advices uh, on critical ill patients and we also attend to referrals so there would be daily ward rounds and uh, during these ward rounds, uh, there would be a separate infection prevention control ward rounds time to time and advices would be given. Uh, the daily uh, infection prevention and control ward round uh, will be done by the infection control nurses also. Um, and um, uh, we do adjust the... Uh, antibiotic dosing depending on the patient's organic uh, dysfunction and uh, but when I say this uh, you also need to have a uh, uh, good uh, knowledge on uh, uh, the antibiotic prescribing because uh, uh, we can't go through each and every patient who are on antibiotics. So you need to see because most of the time what I see when I am doing the ward round would be uh, patient is on antibiotic for a long time, maybe four to five days, but not a single serum creatinine levels are being done. Not a single ASTLT uh, results is, um, would be available for us. So after five days time, we need to go and tell you all, okay, the patient is on antibiotics. So you are supposed to do a, a serum creatinine. So you are supposed to do a full blood count. You are supposed to do a, a CRP levels. You are supposed to do a ASTL. It is not acceptable because you we actually, we only see few patients who are being referred to. Other patients, you need to look after. You need to look after. Uh, there is no saying that... Uh, okay, this patient is the microbiologist patient and these are ours. There is no saying that. So you need to have a basic understanding of how to monitor patients on who are on antibiotics so, or maybe a patient who would be having or would be receiving antibiotics in the future. That is depending on your clinical diagnosis. So adjustments on antibiotic dosing we would be doing and we would be advising you uh, regarding further testing related to microbiology because when we attend to our referrals we when we do not see an initial good response to the antibiotics we would be looking for another course of the infection. So uh, depending on our uh, clinical uh, diagnosis, we would be performing mycology, special, the um, fungal uh, diagnosis, that is mycology. So MRI is the reference laboratory uh, for that. And uh, uh, there is a separate uh, investigation forms and the separate referral forms uh, which are uh, adapted in the MRI mycology department and you need to get familiarized with those things. There is a separate uh, request form for MRI that is for the other um, uh, request forms but for the mycology specimens you need to uh, send it with the specialized uh, mycology referral uh, uh, form which has been sent to your hospital by MRI. So you need to remember this thing because most of the time when the referral form is not uh, really uh, properly filled and not sent, uh, the laboratory staff would be in a great dilemma in issuing certain uh, lab reports. So TB, uh, the reference lab is in Valisera. So you need to send the samples, especially culture samples would be sent to uh, Valisera. Uh, uh, the, uh, if the PCR is available, the gene expert machine is available, some uh, hospitals uh, would perform the gene expert PCR uh, in their uh, premises, but most of the thing will be done in belly cell. Uh, viruses, there are uh, services available in MRI, candy, 
Anuradhapura and Karapitiya. And these are the central centers and they are, the clusters would be allocated uh, to each of these centers. And depending on your uh, hospital where it is situated, you might have to select uh, a center from one of these. So uh, regarding antibiotics, I need to kind of uh, give a for brief introduction on this as well. This is the empirical and prophylactic use of antimicrobial, the national guidelines. This is prepared by the Sri Lanka College of Microbiology in collaboration with other colleges and Ministry of Health. And uh, you can see this is published in 2016. So uh, uh, this is under the review at the moment, and this will be very soon uh, 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 published uh, with the new uh, edit uh, and uh, up, until then you can kind of have a uh, guidance uh, towards um, using uh, rational use rationally using the antimicrobials uh, but uh, keep in mind this is uh, published in 2016 because uh, some of the things some of the uh, uh, the, some of the uh, um, recommendations uh, would no longer be valid because of our resistance rate. Uh, and uh, again, I need to kind of emphasize on the fact this is not a very hard and fast rule. Uh, this is only a guidance. Uh, you need to kind of adapt this and uh, in the uh, mind frame of uh, the antimicrobial resistance in your hospital as well. So that is why the microbiologist and the team is available for you all uh, to help you all in guiding this um, rational use of antibiotics. So the other thing would be um, infection prevention and control services in the hospital. Uh, so this is a huge uh, service uh, which is under the supervision of the consultant microbiologist and uh, uh, infection prevention uh, and control is a series of procedures and there are guidelines uh, to prevent um, to prevent um, um, to prevent and control hospital acquired infections and uh, this should be applied to all settings where the healthcare is provided. So uh, these Guidelines and practices sometimes uh, are below the uh, required standard of uh, standard in developing countries as like, I don't know whether now we are in the category of developing countries. I'm not so sure about it, but um, uh, commonly in uh, developing countries, lack of resources, poorly designed uh, because uh, most of the time our hospitals are not at all designed according to the infection prevention and uh, control guidelines and policies. Uh, some wards do not have a single sink uh, which is which can be used for uh, hand hygiene. Uh, so uh, overcrowding of course a problem in our hospitals, lack of basic facilities and understaffing. Um, these are the kind of drawbacks uh, in our setting. And uh, these are the like um, uh, the leg pulling uh, things in our infection control prevention and uh, facilities. But um, even with these things, uh, most of our hospitals are doing a maximum uh, uh, service in infection prevention and control and I'm very much proud to uh, say that uh, uh, our infection control uh, prevention and control facilities are kind of uh, are in a better standards than uh, any other. <coughs> so this is the um, Hospital Infection Prevention Control Manual. Uh, this is the second ed edition at the, and this is published um, uh, in uh, 2021 and it is available in every hospital, I think, because uh, uh, the college uh, uh, um, 
College of Sri Lanka, um, uh, Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, um, uh, under the guidance of Dr. Geetika Patabendge, the consultant microbiologist in NHSL. Uh, she was the president at the time, and we uh, took pains to kind of distribute this um, infection prevention uh, control manual uh, to each hospital, and uh, most of the units um, were equipped with uh, this manual. So uh, for an example, depending on your hospital, the size of the or the category of your hospital, the uh, uh, manual was distributed uh, according to the bed strength and the, uh, the size of the hospital. So my hospital is a teaching hospital. So my hospital actually has uh, one for each unit. So if you have a problem with the with anything like uh, infection prevention is it's a it's a massive. Uh, uh, you only see uh, the hand hygiene things and the waste management things. Those are the standard precautions that we always talk about. But infection prevention and control goes well beyond that. So this. Uh, manual summarizes most of the infection control things uh, in each specialized unit and in general also. So when you have time, go through this manual and get yourself get yourself uh, familiarized with the things and uh, uh, get an idea because uh, during this one year or maybe even after. Uh, this knowledge will be very helpful for you all uh, uh, as a medical officer when you um, work in a place there are certain practical things that would appear uh, those some practical situations will have a very direct impact on the patient care so infection prevention uh, control guidelines and policies should be followed by all the uh, healthcare workers in all hospitals and all the time. Why I included this uh, uh, slide is that most of the time when you are intern officer, you think, okay, I'm, we are the busy people. We are the, I know, I know you are the busiest people of all the categories, but you can't escape not doing infection control, but prevention and control uh, practices. You need to think every patient as infective, even though it, the patient might be coming for a uh, basic investigation, for a CT scan, or maybe for a surgery, or maybe uh, with fever, every patient can be infective they might be harboring an infection that can spread to another person. So all the time, except in emergencies. Emergencies are the only instance that we don't care much about infection prevention practices as much as we do in other situations. Uh, all the times you need to follow the infection prevention control facilities. You can't come and say when there is an occupational uh, uh, related injury happens, you can't come and say, Madam, Mama, Ganangatte ne, Mathe hitune ne, me patient infective kele. You can't say that. But that is the answer that we are always getting, uh, especially regard to uh, with regard to needle stick injury or maybe splash injury or any other injury related to uh, occupation. So, Organization of the infection prevention control in the hospital. Uh, it's very important to in, uh, have a very good uh, in IPC program in the hospital. Uh, it is actually three-tiered organization. The first one is uh, infection con prevention and control committee. So this committee uh, has the director, consultant microbiologist, MO infection prevention and control if the person is available, ICNO, AO, accountant, matron, and other people who are relevant to uh, the thing. These, this committee actually meet time to time regarding certain infection control problems in the hospital and uh, they take decisions and they these decisions are uh, implemented in the hospital. In teaching hospital Kuliapitiya, there is an infection prevention con uh, and control committee uh, which uh, we uh, meet every 
too weakly and we take a lot of uh, time and effort to uh, streamline our infection prevention and control program. And uh, under this committee, there is the infection control prevention team headed by the consultant microbiologist. And if the MO is available, uh, that person is also included in the team and the ICNOs. So this team is that... Uh, people who would do, you would be closely interacting with and they are the one who would be helping you and uh, uh, regarding notification, regarding uh, any outbreak situation, regarding uh, sticking to uh, standard precautions and uh, the regarding the facilities regarding uh, infection prevention, all the responsibilities come under the uh, infection prevention control team. Uh, and uh, infection uh, prevention control practitioners, those are actually you all uh, and the nurses and all the uh, clinical staff who would be involved in uh, the uh, patient management. Uh, one thing is uh, that uh, most of the infection prevention uh, control uh, practices in the hospital are usually uh, uh, practiced uh, depending on your, the consultant on that respective unit. Most of the time when they are not really concerned about the infection control and prevention, uh, the, the staff who works under him or her will not be uh, practicing those things. But the thing is, don't do that. Uh, even if your bosses, even if your SHOs, if your registrars, senior registrars not practicing these things, you are supposed to do it because uh, one day you would be there in their shoes and you would be taking a, you would be giving an example to your junior staff. So uh, even though we are not really concerned about uh, infection pre prevention and um, control in our hospitals when you go overseas and or when you are like practicing in another hospital which would be one of the very common factors uh, in the future I would say uh, you would see how dedicated they are towards the infection prevention and control and how they scrutinally uh, do certain things to prevent infections in their hospitals so uh, take it a habit to uh, practice these things and take it a habit to kind of uh, stick to these things, get to know uh, regarding these guidelines and policies, uh, which would be very helpful for you in the future. So um, there are two major responsibilities of the infection prevention. Uh, so setting up uh, infection prevention in the hospital. Uh, this is a long-term strategy uh, and uh, they are taking timely and effective. As I said earlier, we uh, meet uh, every two weekly and uh, we uh, uh, do take a decision on how to practice them, the strategies and the, all the things and time to time we deal with outbreaks also. Uh, and uh, they also ensure the infrastructure funding personnel is available because most of the time the, what happens is we, we take decisions. If you don't have the funding from the uh, hospital, we can't proceed. Or maybe the personnel is available, minor staff is, if the minor staff is not available, we can't uh, practice good uh, infection prevention and control in the hospital. So that is why the committee is very important. Uh, so it is the responsibility of the committee to smooth line the, uh, the IPC uh, program in the hospital. So uh, I talked about the IPC team. So they would be uh, doing regular visits, as I said earlier, and liaise with the liaison nurse and the staff in the hospital. And they do surveillance and audits. Uh, the most uh, uh, common audit that you would be uh, audited uh, would be the hand hygiene. And time to time, you will be uh, given your results. Uh, I am very much ashamed to say even most of the hospitals 
doctors are the least uh, people who do the hand hygiene because we always think oh okay hand hygiene is not really important uh, resuscitation the patient managing patient is the uttermost important thing but uh, that is not so uh, we were taught lesson by COVID-19, I would say, regarding infection control practices, especially with regard to hand hygiene. So I would uh, expect you all to keep th that in mind. Uh, so uh, planning and training activities also will be done by the uh, IPC team and uh, they would be closely monitor and ma uh, manage the incidents related to IPC. So that is my lecture. I hope that I have given you a basic uh, uh, understanding regarding infection control practices and microbiology services in the hospital. So uh, if you have questions, I can answer these uh, uh, if you can kind of uh, direct questions uh, 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 through the chat even. Uh, if you don't want to talk, uh, I would can hang around for a few minutes. Uh, my time would be over by one minute. I can give a couple of uh, minutes for you all to kind of answer, uh, ask anything. Uh, I'm ready to answer. So the next next uh, lecture will be done by I think uh, Vasana Kudagamana. Uh, she would be uh, briefing you all regarding microbiological aspect of the sepsis. Uh, I hope that she's available. Yeah, thanks. I'm here. Okay. Right. So if you can, uh, if you don't have any questions at the moment, or if you have uh, more questions, I'm uh, sure that uh, Dr. Vasana would uh, uh, answer these questions. Um, uh, or maybe in later also, there would be several of us uh, would be doing the thing. Uh, so thank you for your uh, uh, attention. Uh, I wish you all the very best uh, for your uh, internship. Thank you. Right. Thank you, madam. So, uh, next lecture is by Dr. Vasana Kudagamana uh, on the topic of microbiological aspect of sepsis. Over to you, madam. Sorry. Can you all hear me? Yes, madam. You need to make it full screen and that's all. I'm Vasana Kudagamana from Teaching Hospital Peradeniya. Uh, um, Madam, can you increase your volume from your mic side? Just bit, uh, or come closer to the computer. Can you hear me well now? Yeah, I guess. I'm recovering from a nasty viral infection, which cut down my physical strength to like a very much low level. Hope you all can hear me now. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, madam. Yes. Oh, great. Thanks. So we are going to go through a very important uh, aspect of patient care. Uh, microbiological aspects of sepsis. Right? Many of your patients one day very soon you all you all come across most of your patients are with features of sepsis where you have to save these lives right so let's uh, go through uh, how to handle your patients who are suspected of sepsis right uh, this is my overview 
how to diagnose sepsis, what are start or time limits of antimicrobial uh, treatments with evidence of uh, sepsis, and uh, best antibiotic empiric choices will be done by another consultant microbiologist uh, together with you all. And you have to consider duration of antimicrobials to come up with the best outcome for your patient, right? Sepsis, hope you all can remember, you all have learned microbiology during your third year, fourth year, and definitely over final year. The sepsis definition, uh, sepsis was defined in 2002 to begin with, and uh, later on, uh, final definition was given by Surviving Sepsis Campaign in 2016, and it is defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction secondary to dysregulated host response to infection. Right? It's it's uh, it's very heavy. Right? Life-threatening organ dysfunction secondary to host response dysregulated which is right so it's it's sepsis skills it's taking almost a, a few lives per second all over the world even now there are deaths happening per second all over the world due to sepsis we can stop this with vigilance and our devotion we can save almost all these lives and we are learning how to do it now right so septic shock is a subset of sepsis which we'll go through carefully and we'll learn what this is right so this is uh, the history of uh, surviving sepsis campaign which is a non-profitable uh, campaign which guiding the whole world to towards better care for all of us right it started from 2002 uh, giving different uh, definitions guiding us uh, providing care bundles for us to follow what to do when to do uh, best evidence gathering best evidence for us to care for the patients who are coming, presenting with possible or definite sepsis. And uh, the latest one is uh, released by 2021, which uh, came right after in the midway of COVID pandemic, which has given lots of uh, insight, new insight for sepsis management, right? So septic shock need to be identified immediately. We have to consider it as medical emergency and it's easy. You can even, anybody can recognize septic shock if you are vigilant and if you take a measure of blood pressure and septic shock is defined in 2016 as persistent hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain MAP mean arterial pressure at this level 65 millimeters mercury which is of course uh, even though the the words are very heavy it's persistent hypotension even after fluid resuscitation which uh, requires uh, vasopressors inotropes to maintain patient uh, blood pressure that indicates your patient is in septic shock, right? And another, which if you have facilities in a place, you a uh, hospital where serum lactate levels are measurable, it indicates it will also support you to uh, get a clue where lactate, serum lactate level is more than two millimoles per liter or 18 milligrams per deciliter, despite of adequate volume resuscitation, it also says 
indicates evidence for a patient in septic shock, which is very easy for us to confirm, right? Cervical sepsis, uh, sorry, sir, uh, surviving sepsis campaign 2021 also suggests capillary refill time to guide resuscitation as many of us uh, might be in a place where uh, serum lactate levels are not available and uh, we are as you all are as uh, internees you will start with the fluid bolus you will feel that the patient is not uh, in a good shape blood pressure is very low you will start uh, with uh, boluses of fluid and if you still feel the patient's uh, uh, perfusion if the patient is not recovering very well by catching capillary capillary refill time it's it's also a supportive feature for you to think the patient in septic shock whereas there are patients who are coming with severe dehydration yeah, the refill time will back, come back to normal after a fluid bolus, one or two, right? That is not septic shock. Septic shock is we are the persistent low level of perfusion, low level of mean arterial pressure, or low high volume of serum lactate indicates, right? So uh, 2021 uh, surviving sepsis campaign guides us to facilitate, we are low facilities are available, like in rural places where the facilities are not much around, you can still pick septic shock in a patient, right? Anyway, septic shock is easy to pick, predict, but sepsis is a diffi difficult thing to predict, right? So sepsis, what is sepsis? Can somebody guess what is sepsis? It's defined uh, in a uh, way that uh, multi-organ failure due to dysregulated host responses. That was the definition, right? So multi-organ failure due to dysregulated host response to an infection. So these response this dysregulated host response may be due to pathogen factors where yeah. there may be pathogens which can provoke massive immune responses in human host and there may be host which sometimes produce undue immune responses even with a simple pathogen which anyway the host has generated undue response which will damage its own organs. So that is sepsis. So how does it happen? This is usually the sepsis occurs primarily, it begins with a primary focus of infection somewhere else. We are maybe a focus, a wound, maybe a joint, maybe bone, maybe lung, maybe at a tiny abscess, which is very well localized to begin with. And then you don't call it sepsis. It's a primary, if there is a primary focus and a primary focus is very well localized and the infection is at that site only. So the host response is directed to generate immunity or defense against that infection at the local site of infection, wherever it is at, as the primary site. But the sepsis is when this focus of infections is spilling the bugs, spilling the organisms to circulation. So the body will not be able to localize the site of infection. That is why the dysregulation happens when the 
site of infection spilling the organisms to the circulation where the bacteremia happens and then the host response will be not very well focused to the primary site but it will start attacking the whole circulation and the whole body so the host response will be overall all over the body so the immune response will damaging your the host kidneys maybe lungs maybe liver maybe brain or the vasculature all over that is sepsis right so to begin with this may be occult we will we might not be able to see obviously right so patients may be presenting with nicely well focused infections where yeah, we can easily treat them and send them home but if they are presenting with early sepsis where yeah, the focus of infection is giving over and spreading to the circulation and bacteremia happens where yeah, that is the point you have to catch the patient very early to start aggressively treat and save otherwise when the patient is in sepsis where the spilling has happened from the focus of infection to the circulation the patient is in sepsis and the next level will be the septic shock right the subset of uh, sepsis where the septic shock occurs the blood pressure which has gone beyond its control that is like irreversible level the saving that patient will be very difficult right so saving a patient at the sepsis level is still difficult but easier than it is he is going into septic shock and it's easier if you can pay, treat the patient at the level which he has not gone into sepsis that is the patient is with the very well localized infection right but many of the patients many of us as patients will not present to the doctors uh, when we have a localized infection it may be occult and the spreading from site initial site to the circulation may be occult right may not be seen obviously that is why you all are there as internees to see these patients evaluate on admission as early as possible to catch these patient patients before going to sepsis and septic shock right so how are we to catch this sepsis now you know how to uh, catch septic shock it's easy right when they are not recovering from fluid resuscitation when the requirements are continuously there to maintain their blood pressure when capillary capillary, capillary refill time is much uh, inadequate despite of volume resuscitation you know septic the patient is in septic shock that is too late that is too late still you have to take immediate action and the stage before is sepsis so how are we to catch this stage now how are you to catch uh, patients at this level right this is the same description that uh, i described uh, described so uh, local very well localized infection spreading to circulation this is sepsis where many organs can affect with this regulation of host response which is very well targeted to the focal of infection initially now the host cannot locate the site of infection it's all over so all organ will get affected with the immune response this is sepsis how are we to catch this sepsis early to prevent death prevent mortality and morbidity which is very high 
so uh, surviving sepsis campaign recommendations uh, were there very different recommendations came up to begin with in 2002 it recommended us to use SERS as a screening tool to detect sepsis in patient with shock or in early sepsis in 2016 another screening tool came up so far sequential organ failure assessment tool and uh, q so far it's a quick so far it's a very simple screening tool came up to guide the patients uh, to pick patients from sepsis right and uh, 2021 december recommends it's uh, against to use q sofa alone right they there there were a few other uh, sepsis screening tools came up uh, other than the SERS and so far, news and mills, I know you all have heard all these and learned all these, will revise all these. So the latest recommendation is against to use, not to use Q so far, but to use almost all or at least two more tools other than q sofa because q sofa alone might miss that is their worry right sirs alone might miss patient in early sepsis so the uh, the latest recommendation is for us to use at least two more screening sepsis screening tools to catch patients with sepsis right hope you understood Right? Can you all remember these tools? Yes? You want me to uh, go through all these? Anybody with me? Hello? Am I audible? Nobody's talking. Right? So these are the septic screening tools. And you must know all these, right? At least if you can make notes now itself. Ah, yes. Go through them. Yes. If those who are with me, could you please uh, take a paper and a pen and make a table of these and keep this um, paper with you uh, for your internship, right? Keep it aside. Then if you can paste this paper chart uh, next to the place that you are going to clerk your patients, it will help you to save many lives, many innocent lives, many mothers of innocent babies, fathers of innocent uh, kids in this country, maybe in a day in the whole world, right? So keep, take up a pen and a paper and summarize. I know you all have made lots of notes during uh, your uh, undergraduate life, but I, I know you don't keep those notes now because you have strengthened your knowledge and memory with all those. And now you are very well equipped to treat our patients, to look after our patients. But I need this note which should always kept with you in your pocket or by the um, uh, side of your uh, table when you clerk your patient, right? So we are going to go through this uh, SERS, which is very good one, right? Which will evaluate few clinical variables for us to define sepsis, right? And uh, SERS, come up with four criteria, clinical features, and if things are positive for two, that indicates definite sepsis. So far, I don't like so far, why? It's very uh, sort of, it 
and consume lots of energy and uh, cost, right? And so far, Q so far, it's very easy. Q so far comes up with only three features. And if the two coming positive for your patient, you can consider it as definite sepsis. News and muse modified early warning score. All those carry lots of different clinical variables, uh, but still, if you can make a summary and keep it by side of you, and the count is five or more. When the score is five or more, you can come up with uh, the patient as possible, uh, definite sepsis. And these words, definite or probable sepsis, is coming with these scores, right? When SERS is suggestive, two features coming up out of four for your patient, that indicates your patient is with features of definite or probable sepsis, right? So definite or probable sepsis, these are the two different words that uh, surviving sepsis campaigns uh, given us as a guide. And the other word is possible sepsis. That is when the features are not suggestive of sepsis. When the counts, the scores are not more than the given numbers, not more than, it's less than the given numbers, that is possible sepsis. You can't exclude sepsis, so it is possible sepsis, right? When the scores are coming up, more than the count, it's definite or probable sepsis, right? Keep that two, three words as well in your mind before going into details of these screening tools, right? I'll quickly go through. So hope you have gathered, I gave you time to gather a pen and a paper. So SERS criteria. SERS criteria evaluates whether the patient is with high temperature or fever, right? Even hypothermia indicates, gives us a clue for possible sepsis, right? Temperature, heart rate, more than 90, keep that in mind, right? More than 90, because different uh, scores, uh, uh, screening tools take different margins. SERS, I prefer SERS a lot, and many of us use SERS over many years. That is why it's, uh, when I was an internee, we used uh, SERS criteria, right? And that is, uh, so heart rate more than 90, you have to think twice when you touch one patient's pulse. And uh, if the beats are very rapid, think for possibility of this patient in sepsis, right? And white cell count. If the patient is coming up with a report recently done, Otherwise, as an internee, you will not be able to see at the first clocking a white cell count, right? Keep that in mind. So if you worry, if the patient uh, give a vague history of temperature and his heart rate is, if his heart rate is more than 90, you can definitely write request a full blood count, right? And look for respiratory rate. And if the respiratory rate is more than 20 breaths per minute. So two of SERS criteria now fulfilling. Consider this patient in sepsis unless you are going to prove, right? Then you have to hunt for a possible primary focus of infection. From where with which this patient has filled this organism into circulation to go into sepsis. Will he go into shock very soon? That is the thing that you have to think, right? If you are the good, kind person as a doctor, this is what we are expecting from the whole 
generation of uh, doctors, right? So think about this. So four uh, parameters, clinical variables, temperature, more than 38 and less than 36, heart rate more than 90, white cell count less than four or more than 12, respiratory rate more than 20 or carbon dioxide, which of course not available in many places at uh, routine practices other than ICU, right? Don't worry, you can count uh, respiratory rate very easily right from first year uh, medical student you learn to count respiratory rate so that is more than enough to save these lives right and the second tool so you, i hope you added the first first column assess and the second column so far so far uh, the score i uh, added it here as a picture but I uh, hope uh, many of you cannot uh, read it clearly because it it's carries lots of information. It's giving a scoring uh, from zero, one to four. And on this side, it's respiration. And it is coming up as uh, uh, saturation or FiO2 and coagulation. It's platelet count is coming up, right? Platelet count, if the patient is presenting with a uh, count, blood count tested, you can refer to this one and look at the platelet count and see uh, the count is uh, normal, which is no more than 150. If it is less, it indicates evidence of sepsis. And so for giving scores, one for in between, 100 and 150. If it is less than that, so far it's giving two and more, right? And liver functions, bilirubin. That indicates multi organ failure, high, high level bilirubin, right? And cardiovascular system, it's uh, the sofa needs us to measure mean arterial pressure, right? Which is not so practical. This is for the ICU uh, care. And CNS. Central nervous system, it's easy. You know how to measure, how to evaluate a patient's consciousness from anatomy to final year, right? GCS maximum is 15. And if it is low, consider this patient is with a possible sepsis, right? Renal functions, right? It's coming up as creatinine levels. That's why I said, so far is good, but uh, it consumes lots of energy and cost money for us to evaluate. So don't worry. It's If you are placed at an ICU, use this and try to figure out whether the patient is in sepsis, right? And if uh, the score is more than two, it indicates definite evidence of sepsis, definite or probable sepsis more than two, right? Just one reading of platelet count less than uh, 100 indicates positive so far. So don't give up on so far score anyway, right? Keep it uh, as the second column of your this thing. And it evaluates again respiratory system, coagulation through platelets, liver functions, cardiovascular mean arterial pressure, consciousness came up, SERS didn't come up with that, right? And renal functions. Okay, the next one is QSOFA. I know you all know this, right? During your ICU uh, training uh, sessions, I know nobody will miss, I uh, have ever missed this. This is uh, consciousness. It's only three parameters evaluating. When the consciousness is gone, even one score less than 15, you consider it's positive. Respiratory rate here is more than 22 breaths per minute, right? Can you remember so far? Sorry, uh, SIRS, it was, what was it? Just look at your table. 
if you have written yes very good 20 sorry ah go back yes respiratory rate here taken 22 so don't worry so your patient may be in a minute with respiratory rate 22 maybe in another minute 20 and if you keep on keep an eye on him and come back to the patient and see if his his respiratory rate is 25 definitely you have to worry about this patient if his respiratory rate has gone down to 80 so you can relax right so this is how you attend to your patients right so don't worry about these margins it's your patient you have to worry about, right? And the systolic blood pressure here, you so far considered as margin as 100, right? So SERS took it as 90. Was it? Can you remember? Right? So when the patient's systolic blood pressure around 100, around 90, 110, 105, be vigilant on these patients, right? So you will be able to catch them early right so if any of two these features coming positive for your patient with few other parameters catch this patient as pos with possible sepsis and you have to hunt for a primary focus right that is the reason uh, that is the purpose of everything, right? You have to hunt for a primary focus. Ask where, where is the most tender point? What is what happened? You have to ask millions of questions and examine full body to find a primary focus which is filling to give features of sepsis for this patient. Where if you miss, he might go into septic shock in next hour or maybe next day right and this so i think i you are now becoming boring it's again the same thing respiratory rate 12 to 20 20 considered as normal up to 20 right and then beyond that considered significant right saturation if you have a saturation probe you can use it and Anyway, we know when the saturation is less than 96, we worry a bit, right? Even we feel, even when we are talking and if we come up with a saturation of 94, we worry then look at it, right? And cross-check whether it is giving a correct reading or not, right? And if patient needs oxygen, definitely it gives evidence of early features of sepsis, right? Temperature. Of course, as uh, SERS considered, temperature is considered here as in uh, news as well. News later on came up, improved as news too, right? Systolic blood pressure again, heart rate again, and news consider uh, consciousness alert. VPU, what are those? A V P U. Can you remember those? Verbal, responding verbally, responding to pain, and unresponsive. That indicates serious issues. So, news and news two scores. If you consider these, write down those as the fourth column, and at least write uh, margins normal margin so then beyond that level you have to consider significant right no need to give exact scores sepsis early sepsis right and think twice if the features are more suggestive of here the temperature has been considered as a parameter Okay, and the margin for this score is five. If a person is with a score of five or more, 
that indicates definite or probable sepsis, right? And modified early warning score. That comes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's almost the same, like respiratory rate, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, right? So zero values are here where you can think of the normal margins. They also considered 100 as a normal uh, blood pressure. Heart rate uh, upper limit is 100 here. They are first considered uh, 90 uh, and more than 90 to catch uh, as early sepsis. So we go keep the more sensitive level not to miss a single patient with sepsis, right? That is why Surviving Sepsis Campaign 2021 December wants us to use multiple screening tools, not getting adhered to one single screening tool to catch uh, patients with sepsis. We might miss, right? That is why, right? Urine output here, this is a new thing. Right. Uh, so, so far wanted us to use creatinine, which will be very expensive, may not be available readily. It will take 24 hours maybe to get a result of serum creatinine. But here urine output has been considered through uh, modified early warning score system, where no urine output, per hour, ml per kg per hour, or maybe few hours, consider, right? If you can calculate, if you can measure volume of urine during your stay, the patient stay in the ward, if you can consider his urine output is not normal or serum creatinine may be high until you wait for serum creatinine results, measure the body urine output and you can think of possible sepsis and save this life, right? And temperature and again GCS alert, reacting to voice, reacting to pain and unresponsiveness. So those are the clinical parameters where you have to consider to save lives from sepsis, occult sepsis, where you can come up with, right? And save these lives. Now you know how to recognize septic shock, it's easy. Now you know how to catch probable or definite sepsis. Right now, hope uh, you understood now the meaning of sepsis, right? It was very vague to begin with. It's difficult to explain what is sepsis. It's, it's defined with very heavy terms. Now you know how to pick patients with definite or probable sepsis, right? And uh, let's reiterate. Survive, survive, uh, surviving Sepsis Campaign 2021 recommends against using QSOFA alone, right? And suggest to use more than one tool. Now you have nearly five tools summarized in one tiny paper, which will stay with you for the next one year you as an internee, which will save maybe thousands of lives. Take, keep counting how many lives you saved through picking sepsis early with this tiny paper, right? And this is the summary, right? And let's, uh, let's uh, quickly, uh, summarize the rest. It's nothing much. I have only two minutes. I'm going to go into your lunch time, though, right? So, golden hour.
sorry, the golden hour where this is where you have to consider antibiotics to save this life. It's not enough to pick sepsis early. You have to take action next, right? This is what you have to do. Once you have picked sepsis in a patient early, before he's going into septic shock, you have to act. This is golden hour, right? Golden hour is the hour that you can save this life, right? So if the patient in sepsis, shock is present, then you have to act immediately. Administer antimicrobials immediately within one hour of recognition, right? And before that, you have to consider taking samples. Otherwise, you can not save this life, may not be able to save this life because we don't know what is happening inside. We don't know what the primary focus sometimes. So take samples. If you can dig into the details and find a primary focus, take relevant samples as well. If you think if it is urinary tract infection, take urine sample as well before antibiotic. Definitely you have to take blood cultures, right? Blood, ideally two sets of blood cultures. If you don't have facilities, at least take one set of blood culture taken under aseptic conditions. Otherwise, you will contaminate and the outcome will be bad on the patient, right? We find it difficult to predict if contaminants coming up as positive. It will misguide patient treatment. So try to take all the precautions to prevent contamination of the sample. Take aseptic precaution. Take microbiological samples before give, giving, uh, using this golden hour. Take blood samples for culture, relevant microbiological samples for culture. If there is a wound, take wound base, uh, tissue samples for culture. Uh, any other focus, if you think, consider taking microbiological samples and then use antibiotics appropriately right how to pick the best appropriate antibiotics another um, lecture will be available for you to listen to that right so consider that one so timing of antibiotics here shock is present now you know how to pick shock and sepsis is definite or probable through the septic screening tools if you can, if you could pick the patient is with uh, sepsis, definite sepsis or probable sepsis when the scores are more than two for Q so far, more than two for SERS, equal or more than two for SERS, five for news and news, consider this patient is with definite or probable sepsis. And if the patient is in shock, use golden hour. Take relevant anti uh, anti um, relevant microbiological samples must you must take blood why sepsis is spilling of organisms from from primary focus to the circulation take blood samples for culture definitely if you could find a primary focus other on a different site take sampling and give appropriate empiric antibiotic, right? And this is another, sepsis is possible, but the patient is in shock, right? Shock, resuscitation, fluid resuscitation doesn't uh, come up with the uh, capillary refill time. Patient constantly need vasopressors, but your screening tools, do not give evidence of definite or probable sepsis. Screening tools fall down below the scores, margins. But still, that's fine. You take samples to save this life because patient in shock, right? You might uh, miss some, might have missed something. So consider this patient even as if the patient is in shock. But the screening tools doesn't give you adequate scores. 
but possible sepsis is there. That's fine. Take blood cultures and start antibiotics within the golden hour. You can rule out anti um, sepsis later on. You can come back to the patient and omit antibiotics later on if the patient has is recovering from the shock, right? And if the parameters are coming down, white cell count is normal, CRP is normal, you can uh, later on come up and exclude sepsis, right? Use this golden hour whenever the patient is in shock. And you know what is shock? It's persistent uh, hypotension despite of adequate fluid resuscitation and uh, persistent uh, refill time flow, right? right? So when shock is absent, patient is not in shock, but when the uh, sepsis screening tools are coming up with evidence of definite or probable sepsis, go ahead, save the patient by using this golden hour. Take relevant samples, relevant microbiological samples. Blood culture is a must. And if you could find a focus, take relevant samples and go ahead with empiric antibiotics. And then you can evaluate the patient uh, later on and omit or exclude once you exclude infection, right? So that is it. Sorry, I have taken too much time to explain though. And there is a three hour bundle, right? When the patient is not with shock and features of sepsis is not definite or probable, but possible sepsis. So you have to use three hour bundle where you can delay antibiotics until three hours. You take a, a white cell count, make it urgent. Uh, you can take CRP or any other thing. You can do ultrasound scan to find any focus. And then you can decide and uh, on antibiotics, right? If, when the patient is not in shock and when septic screening tools does not give strong evidence of sepsis, right? Yeah, you have to go for three hour bundle. And if the features are suggestive and when the additional information coming up as possible to probable or definite sepsis, take samples and immediately start antibiotics, empiric antibiotics relevant, right? You can, uh, this, yeah, we have given three hours to go for more in, uh, investigations, more to gather more evidence of sepsis, right? Where the risk is much less for this kind of patients. We are not in shock. Screening tools, multiple screening tools gives much less evidence for sepsis. Okay. And this is the summary, nothing much, right? This is a resuscitation bundle, six hour bundle. This is not uh, related to microbiology, but other medical management. That is all. And you must reevaluate. Without this slide, I don't want to uh, terminate, right, my discussion. So you have to reevaluate the patient, whether he has recovered, whether he is going bad to worse, whether uh, the investigations uh, sent are uh, uh, coming up with the appropriate guesses that we have made. See whether the patient is recovering or getting complications. So you have to readjust your management uh, and uh, optimize the therapy, whichever we have decided over the first golden hour and the third hour or later on, right? You have to definitely revisit and evaluate the patient. And the source control is another uh, thing that you have to consider if the patient is not recovering with initial uh, antibiotics, right? And no, do not change antibiotics uh, from first dose to the second dose to the third. Sometimes we see 
uh, doctors changing very first dose was given something else and after six hours we start with another one and uh, next 24 hours another one don't do that uh, patient needs at least three consecutive uh, doses of antibiotics to get the therapeutic levels right you can add and if you want to optimize add and start uh, smart right to cover most right and you can tailor later on tailor depending on the culture results other evidences can evidences uh, antibody uh, results with those you can uh, tailor the patient later on target after 48 hours right that is all which sorry i took uh, this is a recall slide these are all recall slides uh, the antibiotic um, empiric antibiotic guide that the college is providing you with and this is the take home message right evaluate sepsis and septic shock re-evaluation is a must escalate source control and finally define the duration of the for the antibiotics to give the best outcome for the patient thank you very much sorry i could couldn't uh, uh, finish it on time any questions Right. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. So we have a tea break from uh, 10 30, 10 40. Since we have taken an extra time, we will start by 10 45 the next uh, lecture.